everyone. This is update for October 13, 2022, date 232 of the war and of the date update. Um, so um, I'm going to again focus today on more just sort of general information as opposed to uh, military one. It's just simply there is not much going on on the battleground. So I'm pretty sure both sides are preparing for uh, decisive sort of moves, but um, right now there is not much going on. So first, um, I would like to uh, mention that uh, there is a URL for YouTube now for the channel, because some people were telling me before that uh, it's really hard to find the channel and uh, basically it's hard to sort of share it and so on. So now YouTube, well actually Google uh, came out came out with what they call handle. So essentially this is URL. So every channel can pick uh, its own URL on YouTube. So what I did, I picked this uh, WIU. So that's, uh, uh, that's a URL that you can find this channel uh, with. Now let's move to sort of more interesting things. Uh, I mentioned about the Ukrainian internet and so uh, so what happened is that the Ukrainian internet was functioning pretty well despite the war and even in the areas that were affected by the war it was still functioning pretty well as long as um, let's say in the like area west and north of Kyiv people still had internet as long as you have electricity so that was the uh, the problem was mostly not even uh, so much um, internet which was there, but the electricity. And uh, I would like to discuss why uh, basically Ukraine internet in Ukraine is really sort of shining example of how things should work. Uh, and Unfortunately, the rest of the country in other areas is completely opposite of the situation with internet. Uh, and so, and this is actually hopefully um, uh, viewers can learn and apply the same sort of framework to analyzing any situation because this is not just about internet. You can apply it to anything you want, and I will I will try to bring up a few other examples. Uh, from sort of real life that are sort of happening in the West. Um, so the reason, first of all, Ukrainian internet works so well and is actually faster than, let's say, in the most countries in the West, and it's very resilient, is there is, um, and there is this report, this is the URL for the report, you can actually, uh, you know, find it and read it by yourself. Unfortunately, the report is kind of, not very straightforward. In, in other words, the person did sort of right analysis, but could not articulate in a clear and a simple way what's really happening. So we'll try to hopefully, you know, explain what's really happening. So what uh, the author is saying is that like Ukrainian uh, internet works because there's lack of market concentration at end user networks. It's kind of a little bit... Um, probably too abstract for most and very hard to understand. So what really he's trying to say, there is no monopolization uh, at the level of internet providers. That's in a simple way. So what this really means uh, in uh, Ukraine in this way, probably quite unique, uh, especially relative to the West, where everything is super extremely monopolized, uh, where you can have ISP that serves literally one village right like or you know like if there is a town there will be probably three four five uh isps like local ones they they not they not concentrated and not owned by you know one big sort of company like for example i don't know probably in um in germany that would be deutsche telecom and um in in the uk probably what's uh, British Telecom or BT, they could, they, they just rebranded themselves, so it doesn't sound as bad or whatever. Uh, something similar happening in uh, in the US, in Canada, in, in 
pretty much everywhere you can go. The 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 sort of communication uh, era is uh, internet specifically at ISP level is extremely monopolized in the West, and that's why the speeds are worse in the in the sort of traditional countries of the West relative to let's say for example like South Korea, like uh, like Asia, like Ukraine, like actually Russia, as Russia has similar situation to Ukraine, uh, plus or minus. So what's really happening is, um, uh, and the reason why it's so resilient is because this whole network is um, made up of extremely large number, small ISPs, so if one ISP goes down, it doesn't create a big problem for the rest of the network, right? It still can function, it just redirects around that small hole. And even if there are more holes, it still can redirect, right? So that's the whole point. What the uh, author trying to say is there is extremely competitive market uh, for the internet services for the end user. So as a result, it's what is called the, the market extremely f uh, fragmented, which is um, typically in the West that's sign sign of the sort of bad thing or sort of opportunity to create monopolization. This is actually great thing, and that's actually how the market and and every system should function that wants to be um, resilient and efficient and and sort of can survive for long run. So that's that's the reason for that so the what he's saying is like there's no dominant players in the market so that's what i was trying to say so <laughs> specifically he brings this information so you see this kind of like segment uh, of a circle so what this really means is the this is the share of the largest providers and they have only collectively 45 percent uh, of the market as you can see, this is uh, uh, this is Kiev Star, this is UMC, this is they, they, these are actually uh, mobile uh, operators in Ukraine. So in a way, mobile this and this this analysis was is more applicable to uh, sort of like a desktop internet, so with home internet. Let's put this way because uh, mobile uh, internet is actually uh, equally sort of monopolized in Ukraine as everywhere else. It's the same pattern. Essentially, there is, a, oh, I want to even say, really just one player, which is uh, Kiev Star, and then there is a much smaller one, which is UMC in this case. When they changed names several times, now it's a thing called Vodafone, but it's not real Vodafone. It's just they just bought the name, and that's what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> and so this is, so this is kind of like this, um, kind of like how to say the product of monopoly in their uh, mobile networks. So, so that's why they have such a big, because, you know, all of their mobile traffic goes through this, uh, through, through them. So you, it's in a way, unfortunately, unavoidable. Uh, and where their internet network is resilient, it's thanks to, not obviously because, because of this, they actually sort of problem, right? But <clears throat> because of this um, sort of at home, desktop internet that's available everywhere and even let's and, and by the way I just want to mention that even small villages in ukraine have very fast internet sense because uh, because there is like because there is incentive um, for the like, small entrepreneur in the village go and create isp and bring like fiber uh, to the village and basically create fast internet and earn money and there is no, and the, probably one of the big reasons why this is possible and happening is there is not much regulation. It for 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 better for some reason I, that actually I don't have explanation for that. Somehow this area is basically almost not regulated or extremely lightly regulated in Ukraine, and probably something similar happening in Russia. So as a result, you have all of these entrepreneurs that go to the villages and bring internet, right? <laughs> so kind of like last mile um, internet um, or of, let's say uh, cable that they, that's what they do essentially, because otherwise if you rely on the government, never happens. This is actually um, 
believe this is actually Ukertel net. This is this uh, government, uh, mo- well, it's not monopoly, but basically used to be government monopoly that's pretty much dead because it's absolutely incompetent and in uncompetitive. Uh, this one is Volia is is actually um, and this is actually could be a good example of why this concentration is bad. So this company is basically uh, the they got uh, well uh, based, it's a financing from the West. So from private equity and they just rolled up, uh, they, they came and they decided to concentrate and uh, bought several smaller providers, rolled them up into bigger company, call it Volia, which translates as freedom and it's actually anything but freedom basically because it's monopoly and it's basically disempowerment of everyone and they have, have horrible... Um, customer service, horrible customer reviews, uh, but they managed to survive because in certain like areas, they kind of essentially managed to create local monopolies. And, and so that's actually example of that, that bad uh, outcomes that happen if you have monopoly or, or near, near monopoly, oligopoly, I guess you could say that. Um, Lifestyle is again is another um, uh, a mobile operator and then the rest of them you can see those are sort of real players they tiny uh, and the 55 percent so this is this all of this green segment is 45 uh, percent right 55 percent are covered by huge array of small ISPs um, and each of them serves less than one percent of, uh, of population Right. So, so you, what you have, you have this like last mile of the fiber uh, cable that's not concentrated and distributed in the hands of many, many entrepreneurs, which creates very competitive environment. And as a result, that whole network uh, is, um, first of all, serves uh, and consumer. Uh, and the second is sort of byproduct. It's extremely resilient and reliable, right? So and then the second point mm, that he's making is because all of this ISPs, they need to sort of connect. They, otherwise, they kind of like islands, similar to how we looked at the energy uh, infrastructure, right? There are those um, producers of electricity, but then there are those uh, transformers or call it interconnectors that connect this whole producers into one big system. So there is something similar in the, they call it internet exchange points or IXPs for short. So Ukraine has 19 of those uh, and there is no single dominant IX, uh, IXP. So again, there is no uh, concentration, there is no monopoly or uh, oligopoly or anything like that. And all of that sort of traffic is more or less evenly distributed through many IXPs, which again creates a resilience because if one IXP goes down, there's still many left to channel the traffic through, right? So you can see that this competitiveness at ma- multiple levels creates as a whole extremely resilient uh, system. And then, then we also go to the physical layer, actually the cable itself. And what happens there is <coughs> because it's done by small entrepreneurs it's mm, there's no lack of ownership right they care about what they do they invest they they try to do right things they're not just trying to squeeze the 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 highest profit possible uh, and kind of like trying to basically do bare min bare minimum in terms of maintenance right so that's why in ukraine there's most of the villages they have like a fiber cable, right? Which is, let's say five, 10 years ago, not many places in the West had fiber cable in large numbers, right? So that's the result of that. And because of that, they also put that uh, like deeper on the ground, whatever they, 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 they basically ensure that it's all super safe, that cable when it goes. <clears throat> so, and that's, that's another result because there is no disempowerment because if you have like large players, like large corporations and 
uh, mo large monopolies. Uh, all of the employees there are essentially disempowered and they really don't care, right? And so you have like throughout the whole that system lack of um, um, of ownership, right? So and that's why you know you can have like technical failures. They get resolved because there's procedures. So how? But they 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 not resolved quickly. They just kind of like resolve sort of in the due course. Versus here, uh, the first thing is a the the physical layer is also is better uh, and more resilient in the first place. And then there's also because there is ownership, right? And there's direct connection between the owner of the company and engineers, and there's no huge layer of sort of uh, intermediate management, right? So the communication is really fast <clears throat> and people care, right? About the, what this, what I'm saying is there's ownership. And so the, the engineers or technicians, if something happens, they repair it super quickly. Like you don't need to wait for hour or half an hour to talk uh, at someone in the call center. It's pretty much you talk to the owner or you talk to the technician directly and he just comes and solves the problem. So it's overall much better system because there is ownership. And this is generally the problem in the West that's been, you know, growing and growing bigger and bigger over, I don't know how many years, but let's say at least 50 years, maybe maybe 60, maybe 70, don't, don't know for sure, where there is a complete disempowerment uh, of the people of employees of the because of the because of the monop monopolistic structure of the economy and becomes more and more monopolistic so as a result <clears throat> there is lack of ownership right there's even like uh let's say motivational uh, books written and videos made have seen on youtube where you know people try to say like motivate people to have like ownership in whatever they do and they don't understand that that's not the not the people's problem. That's not an uh, individual's problem. It's the problem of the structure of the economy that forces them to behave in that way because that's the most sort of logical behavior when you are disempowered as employee. Let's put it this way. And so that's sort of normal behavior that you can that every human being will will sort of exhibit just because that's how they. This is the conditions that they are uh, put into. So giving all of this, then as a result, there is very quick recovery of those uh, of the damaged um, <clears throat> damaged fiber. So as you can see, the whole the whole kind of idea is that <clears throat> there should be uh, no concentration, no monopolies, no oligopolies. It's <clears throat> the market should be as competitive as possible. Uh, and that ensures extreme resilience mm, and and best out, basically best outcomes for the consumers for the society right as a whole um, because if you create monopolies just a very handful number of people benefits to the detriment of the entire society so in other words they don't bring any value they actually dis value destructive for the society and for everybody uh, except for the few people uh, so this is why I actually have here this book that sometimes people recommend, like, uh, sorry, ask, like, okay, would you recommend any um, interesting or good book? So I would recommend this book by uh, Ludwig uh, Erhard. Um, it's called Prosperity Through Competition. If you're really lazy, you probably, just by reading this three, uh, three words, you know what sort of the essence. That's all you need to know, essentially. That's the most sort of profound um, how to say, sought in this book. It just basically brings examples, explain, provides more detail, but that's really what this whole book. So if you don't want to read, you just read this title and you really, like, you are uh, as dangerous as it's possible to be, right? And, and, and unfortunately, this is actually very ironic in many ways because this uh, Ludwig Erhard, uh, essentially created what what we kind of call right now uh, German miracle after World War II. Obviously, German you know people wanted to change, wanted to work. You know they, they had sort of um, right mindset, but without sort of right 
uh, system, that mindset would not be realized in a positive way. And thanks to this person, uh, that sort of mindset was realized in a positive way because what he dr tr tried to achieve after World War II in Germany is to break up monopolies because what <clears throat> Hitler did and sort of um, National Socialist sort of party did in Germany, they created basically monopoly in pretty much every single industry, right? Because in their view, it's the most efficient way to produce <clears throat> large number of goods, preparation for the war and, and so on. That's just their sort of view. And that's why they are socialists, right? They, they, you know, there is, you know, they famous for this sort of Nazi part, but most people don't don't realize that they were socialists as well, right? Where they believe uh, in sort of disempowerment and total control. That's really what that is all about, because monopolies and that go they go hand in hand, right? Because monopolies is about disempowerment and full control. Uh, and concentration of power in the hands of few. So what he did after World War II, after the, the defeat of the Germany, he, he basically went about you know, breaking up monopolies in the German economy. He did not fully succeed, but even that limited success he had allowed Germany to really uh, grow quick in the 50s, uh, and I think early 60s. So that's thanks to not to sort of all those politicians that sort of <clears throat> took the fame, but it was just, you know, one person who essentially um, allowed Germany to be uh, what it is um, after World War II, right? And, and unfortunately, German, German, Germans didn't sort of truly appreciate, didn't really... Um, internalize what this person did to them and so they kind of like over time reverting more and more to this uh, system of monopolization uh, in Germany in German economy and that really backfires because the the economy becomes uncompetitive and anemic and that's part of the reason why Germany in, is clinging so desperately to under <laughs> the Russian gas supplies because if you're not competitive, <clears throat> one way to stay sort of afloat is to get uh, cheap resources so you can kind of like essentially compete through those cheap resources, right? And then sort of like you, you're still trying to exploit that, you know, made in Germany, sort of what people used to, you know, used to experience, high quality and so on. And that quality is no longer there, but you're still exploiting that sort of psychological... Uh, you, that's you, you basically you're getting that psychological effect in to some extent. Eventually, that will wear out as well completely, and there will be a problem. Uh, but <clears throat> going back to this is this whole idea is is about competition and if in having many players, right? Not having concentration, and that's what ensures the strongest system. And the most beneficial for everyone in society. So, like another example that I would like to bring, sort of like an like negative example, where, where not just, for example, monetization of the you know, like internet market in the West as a whole, but uh, for example, um, what's called monocropping uh, in, in the uh, specific, specifically in the U.S. in agriculture. So again, it's again, it's monopolization but in in somewhat different way but it's the same play where you the farmers essentially through incentive system forced to basically grow two or three crops and not they don't really change the crops they just grow the same crop every year and that exhausts the land right the food is having extremely low nutritional value as a result of that. I'm not, just want to make sure it's not about the energy density of the food. It's about nutritional uh, value of the food, basically nutri nutritional density food. It goes really down, it gets low quality food that undermines <clears throat> uh, the immune system of the sort of consumers of that food 
and then you have a lot of sick people in society, right? So this is how it kind of like flows and affects society in in negative way. And really, it's not um, the far it's not the farmer's choice. Again, it's again the concentration of power in the hands of few uh, large um, food processing corporations that essentially um, push farmers to do what they want. Right? Again, it's concentration so because on the surface some, i can i can imagine some people responding yeah us is whatever i don't know 100,000 farmers or 200 they th that's 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 actually incorrect uh, view on the system the, the correct view on the system you need to look throughout sort of like from the from the start till the end and where the sort of center of control of this whole uh, uh, system from the beginning from the farmer which is on the ground is at the food processing and food processing in us is fairly concept it's not quite monopoly but it's essentially oligopoly and part of the reason for example why us had those shortages of saying baby formula or baby milk whatever it's called is again this is exactly that that's a result of it of extreme concentration oligopoly slash monopoly I, didn't, I just didn't research enough of that specific industry but something like that and that creates problem in the society and as i said it's not only creating problems that <clears throat> you know then there's a shortage of whatever but the problem is even bigger is <clears throat> it's uh, it also damages health of the society right and then as a result of that if let's say most of society has poor health your expenses <coughs> on healthcare are extremely high right so like for example if you look at the us uh, us is its absolute outlier in terms of the healthcare expenses as a percentage of uh, gdp it's not just like by let's say more by 10 percent. it's like more by <clears throat> i think like four or five times relative to other system right so there is again <clears throat> then there is huge this need for medical help and not to mention about the quality of that help but the quality of the help is all, health health care is also pretty pretty mediocre relative in the in, among the, the developed world right so <clears throat> again so you can see this is all very interconnected how it works um and that's why and uh going back to all of this so just for example in ukraine right now <clears throat> so in, in let's just look at the ukrainian agriculture and sort of apply the same <clears throat> same same framework what you will see is uh ukrainian agriculture is kind of like two worlds right and one is this large industrial uh, far, i wouldn't even call them farms so like uh, so a large industrial agriculture enterprises that control, as I said before, like 40, 50, 100,000 hectares, like some of them even 200,000. All right. So those those ones where it's all completely, you know, disconnected, disempowered, <clears throat> the owners could be sitting somewhere in in uh, in Nice, in, in France. You remember those who remember, I sh you know, I shared that video where this investigation, all of these people who economically benefiting from Ukraine, you know, but really not participating uh, in the defense of the country and just sitting and waiting out on their yachts uh, in on the uh, in Nice and remember somewhere like all of those nice areas in France essentially. Uh, I think it was Monaco is another place. Uh, so they completely dis disconnected right from actual um, you know situation on the ground and then there are then small scale farmers so people who uh, this is again the same people who continue planting and growing food are actually who more resilient as those small scale farmers actually because they connected to their community to their land and, and to their own survival they invested because it's all you know, they don't grow, they don't have income, they have nothing, you know, next year. So they try to figure out how to make it happen. Versus for this large industrial enterprises, 
this is a question of you know capex or investing or not investing right and you know well let's just skip this year let's not invest let's save our capital and see what happens next year so in that world it's all very logical decision let's not invest let's not put not not invest our working capital because there is high chance we're gonna destroy it right so again this is this is and you know in that world it looks like a very logical decision but then if you really think from a bigger sort of big picture perspective you're realizing that's actually <clears throat> A very wrong decision and it really doesn't help society and doesn't help to survive society right so again this is another sort of look at all of this why the the monopoly or oligopoly doesn't you know they they essentially the same thing or market concentration in other words is horrific for the society for the long-term survival of the society so <clears throat> hopefully this was a little bit educational and everybody learns for, for themselves and can apply this in, in their specific situations. Because this is not just about this internet. It, it can be applied, as, it, as, as I showed, pretty much everywhere you are. And it, it, it gives you edge in many ways. Okay, now after all of this, let's move to the military situation in Ukraine. So on the 13th, there wasn't much of the Russian uh, attacks against the um, um, energy infrastructures. There were some attacks, but they were, let's say, roughly 10% of what they used to be in the previous two days. <clears throat> there are, um, so what I'm seeing um, like uh, right now is that looks like there is another round of attacks. Uh, we'll find out. I'll, I'll update, provide update tomorrow on the magnitude of those attacks. Uh, there's another thing that's going on in actually Belarus. So president of Belarus essentially, um, mm, he first of all uh, created sort of state of uh, emergency there, or it's called anti-terrorist anti um, attack emergency situation, which obviously there's no any kind of terrorist there. <laughs> it just, um, you know... Uh, opportunity to kind of like can you know seize even more power and create even more control over the lives of ordinary uh, people there in Belarus and what this really means is that <clears throat> there are rumors that um, uh, he will prevent Belarus citizens from leaving Belarus essentially so they can be mobilized into the army <clears throat> so that really also kind of tells us that uh, there is a chance that Belarus will uh, will join in actual sort of uh, Russian forces. I'm not even sure if it's going to be Ukraine or this this war is going to spill over. Who know? Like who knows? But basically, they preparing uh, for something, and it's obviously not not a good sign, not a good news, right? Uh, so that's a that's a situ sort of general situation. <clears throat> now let's move to the works for the front line and let's look at <clears throat> the situation on the state border ukraine did a bunch of sort of retaliation attacks against <clears throat> russian energy infrastructure at least what it could reach essentially because ukraine doesn't have uh, long range uh, missiles so what it could reach it hit a couple i think of uh, transformers in a belgorod or in belgorod area uh, and then also somewhere here in uh, Kursk, uh, Kursk region near the border. So, essentially. so basically Ukraine tried to sort of <clears throat> hit back as much as it could. Uh, it's obviously nothing to the Russian energy system because it's huge. Uh, it's pretty much it doesn't even notice this attacks essentially. It's more sort of um, propaganda attacks essentially. Um, uh, now let's move to the uh, North Luhansk front line. Things here are um, without much change. Uh, Ukrainian troops are advancing and at the snail space. <clears throat> there are reports that they're moving, like basically coming closer here to Svater. Unfortunately, there's not enough information to even 
kind of say update, okay, Russian troops still controlling Kuzemivka or not, but they, there's sort of this extremely slow pace advance, <clears throat> which, uh, again, as I said, is it's, it's lost opportunity, right? And that lost opportunity translates into many more lost human lives as a result of the lost opportunity and as a result of the slowdown. And let me actually show you, <clears throat> this is Russian, Russian troops, Russian command, uh, literally building like um, industrial defense system on this, uh, here on this uh, front line, in, in the, on this North Lines front line. So as you can see, uh, they, this, they, they putting this drago, uh, dragon T's, like at least two lines, they apparent, apparently uh, doing the trenches or it's, on, it's not even a, a clear or anti-tank, um, <clears throat> how to say ditches or whatever you call it in English, I'm not sure. But essentially they're building like in, from like really in industrial way, uh, <laughs> defensive line there. So almost like a mini uh, Magina line, <laughs> or maybe not Magina, like Zif Siegfried line <laughs> or Stalin line or whatever it is. But this really translates into a lot of problems for Ukrainian troops down the road trying to overcome that uh, system. Uh, also, uh, there, are, there are many uh, Russian sort of this uh, conscripts already on the front line, specifically here in this North um, uh, Luhansk front line. <clears throat> and another sort of, and this is very anecdotal, but it looks like some of them actually just surrendering. Basically, they <clears throat> they get they talking to Ukrainian side, Ukrainian soldiers, and <clears throat> basically negotiating, saying like, "Okay, well, we'll surrender." You know, just you know, let's just re let's just arrange that. And some of them do surrender. So <clears throat> there's definitely and this and this is anecdotal, right? I'm not saying this is everywhere. But this happens, right? So this really tells us that mm, the fighting spirit is not uh, there. And, and part of the reason is um, how they being treated as people, because they literally sent by their like, you know, commands, commanders, like somewhere without any instructions, kind of like in the darkness, just go there and sit there, <clears throat> no communication or nothing. And they just feel like um, they, they, you know, they obviously don't feel like they um, they want to fight if they've been treated like that. There's, you, you cannot succeed fighting like that, right? So they, they totally understand that. And that's probably why they some of them decide to surrender without even Ukrainian troops putting any, you know, like much pressure there, essentially, right? Because they feel sort of like abandoned and desperate in, in you know, logical decision. Okay, let's surrender. So this is what's really happening. At the same time, there is already reports uh, in Russia that um, some of the conscripts are dying in meaningful numbers, let's put it this way. <clears throat> there was just one re small report surfaced that in Chilabinsk region, the head of that region already said, like, okay, we got five dead from the front line in Ukraine. This is just the tip of the iceberg. This is just one region, one case. Uh, there's definitely much more going on so mm, that doesn't mean that like for like part so it's, so i just want to also make it very uh clear because some you know people say okay well the, this uh, conscripts they totally not prepared and they just thrown into the battle into the battle unprepared this is probably happening but this is not a systemic sort of issue not systemic approach they are majority of those who <clears throat> need that training still on in their training areas. So this is uh, this is who dying are those who had previous um, military experience that's pretty fresh and relevant, <clears throat> and they don't need much sort of refresher. Let's put it this way. So those are obviously sent in the first place to the battlefield because Russian command is desperate. They really need. Um, people on the ground because simply they cannot create the front line essentially. So that's that's kind of situation there. 
Um, so this is kind of like, uh, we kind of cover this situation on this um, uh, North Luhansk section of the front line. Uh, now let's move south. Let's see what's going on, on in North Donbass, where the Wagner mercenaries are operating. So <clears throat> today uh, there were no uh, advances by Wagner mercenaries. Uh, they continue sort of hammering at Ukrainian defenses in Solidar and Makhunske. Here, they, for the further reason, they have uh, less, they have pretty much zero success here. Most of the success where they have actually is kind of like this area south of uh, Bakhmut and, and also this one where they created this big salient almost all the way to this village Pereskovivka and a little bit like straight south of Bakhmut where they reached this village Opetne here. <clears throat> so uh, they continue their attacks, they don't stop. Um, and as we can see over, let's say, past months and a half, two months, they, they, they do advance. This is probably the only part of the Russian military that's still uh, able, is able to achieve something, right? To make some, some, some advances, uh, have some successes. They have limited successes, they're not, you know, they're not uh, sort of uh, anything huge or major, but at least sort of for Russian propaganda, they can sort of say, oh, okay, you know, they, there, is some, there is something positive going on. And basically, and, and actually adding to this, what happens is that um, Prigozhin, who is, uh, I called him manager, of this Wagner mercenaries or the, you know, uh, face figure for all of the system, because this whole system is really <clears throat> part of the KGB system and he's not really owner. He just kind of like, uh, I'll say the figure that sort of like just for the world external for the external world. So what he's trying to do now, he's trying to build on this sort of relative success. And he starts to overshadow uh, Russian military top, specifically Russian Minister of Defense. He starts to kind of like commenting on on the actions of the Russian military of defense, defense, and obviously they are not 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 successful actions. So many people start to think that he becomes too prominent, too strong, that um, Russian president may sort of consider, sort of kind of call it like removing him because he potentially create becoming a threat and potential center of the power that can uh, potentially displace um, a Russian president if there is a ch if there is internal coup. It's not going to change anything because Prigozhin is in many ways is even more sort of how to say mm, aggressive and capable than the Russian president. So that's not going to change anything from from what's going on, but <clears throat> just internal because there there is there's definitely tension within the you know Russian uh, top because all of these failures, right? So you know if you have failures, the natural sort of sort of step is okay. Let's let's search for new leaders. But let's search for new approaches, right? As a result of that, he he can potentially. Re uh, race to the power in Russia. I'm not saying this is happening, but this is something that needs to be sort of paid attention to and watched because he's clearly had that aspiration in him. Let's put this way. Um, now let's um, let's move a little bit again south. Let's see what's going on on the central Donbass section of the front line. <clears throat> Here, the only active is this area around this Piski salient where the Russian troops are, are continuing advancing. Uh, they, you know, I don't know, they advance like 20 meters every day or whatever, 50 meters every day. So as a result, they they control about a third of the village, which is called Pervomaiske, which is next to Piske. It's it's obviously tiny progress over, this is probably going on, uh, let's say for, well, at more than a month and a half, let's, actually probably almost two months since Russian troops captured Piski. So this is extremely slow progress, but nevertheless, we see some some progress there. That's another area where this is, in, in addition to that Bakhmut area, 
where the Russian troops have some some progress. It's obviously uh, even sort of less than in near Bakhmut, but nevertheless, there is some progress there. Uh, so there were again attacks, um, no advances <clears throat> to our information, but you know we it's impossible to track you know 20, 50 meters advances every day. <clears throat> now let's move. Let's quickly check the Parisian front line. Things here are uh, quiet uh, since since forever, since actually end of April. There's not much movement here. And as I uh, mentioned before, this front line will be quiet for uh, as long as uh, the Kherson bridgehead is not taken and this North Luhansk uh, situation is not resolved. Mm, because Ukrainian command does not have enough troops right now to create sort of like third uh, area of offensive or open like third front as they were saying during world war ii so for this reason this probably will stay quiet for some time so now let's uh, check what's going on uh, on Kherson bridgehead these here are somewhat uneventful no major ukrainian offenses and as we can see, and there those offenses that happened in the past, as you remember, they were successfully repelled by Russian troops. And the video from yesterday and the situation with the bridges probably explains why Russian troops are managing to handle, <clears throat> to, to keep situation under control for now. But it still doesn't change the long-term projection for this situation, for this bridgehead it's it's gonna it's gonna get lost it's just a question of time but for whatever reason we don't have explanation you know ukrainian troops or ukrainian command was sort of not paying enough attention to the situation with the bridges and they were somewhat rebuilt uh well from what we've seen there are reports that there were again attacks by high mars uh, system against those bridges don't know to which to which point they are successful but there were attacks there again to obviously destroy those pontoon bridges, ferries, and those kind of like art I don't even know how you call it, just kind of those <coughs> artificial bridges, whatever they are. Uh, that's it for today. Thanks for watching, and until tomorrow, bye bye.